Hello, hello everybody and welcome. Welcome to Juma. Myself, my name is Eric, this is Amy and uh, we are in the tent which can only mean one thing. This is the very first episode of On Safari here at Juma. Ladies and gentlemen, this week on Safari, I think we've got a real exciting one for you. We've got some lovely highlights of hyenas playing in the water on a really, really hot day. We've got lizards that have climbed up a tree, some big lizards too, uh, and I think they're making their nest inside there. We've had some lions coming past the hyena den and as well going to uh, one of the dams for a drink of water on a very, very warm morning we're going to dive into some conservation efforts as well as the use of ir lights at night time we're even going to go all the way down to the eastern cape where steve has had a uh, rather nice sighting for us uh, regarding some plants i'm very excited are you excited amy eric i'm so excited to be here i can't wait to dive in and get stuck into this first episode i can't wait either the first clip that we've got for you is uh, a little update on ribbon meet ribbon a spotted hyena with a story as unique as her name. Born in mid-2013, Ribbon was named for the distinctive spot pattern on her left hip that resembles an awareness ribbon. Her left ear, mangled and shriveled, is a reminder of past battles. Ribbon also stands out for lacking a tail, further proof of her tumultuous life within the Juma clan. Ribbon's journey has been anything but straightforward. Starting from a low rank, she challenged Corky, the reigning matriarch, for leadership. In August 2019, Ribbon rose to power, but after a number of violent battles, lost the matriarchy to Corky in November 2021. Everybody's turning on her, so... They're going to keep pushing, especially Corky, and dethrone and take over the clan again, and then they will allow us a lower level member. It's one of those events in one's life where you do not have an answer. As of July 2024, the dynamic between Corky and Ribbon has taken an intriguing turn. The two have been seen denning together and raising their cubs side by side. This alliance makes it difficult to determine who currently holds the title of matriarch and which of the two hyenas is more dominant. Ribbon's story is a testament to the complex social structures and the ever-shifting dynamics within a hyena clan. A fascinating example of how much we have to learn about these maligned, magnificent and fascinating predators. So a lovely, lovely little character update there. Always nice to get to know the characters of Juma and uh, how they do things here. A question that I had for Amy is, is it normal for the hierarchy or the, the, the matriarchy system to uh, kind of shift around in the clan like that? Yeah, it's fascinating. And it's something that in that clip we saw actually happen multiple times within a period of a few years. Mm. Um, if we compare that to another animal that also utilizes the matriarchy social structures, elephants. Mm. And we look at that and we see a female will maintain that role well into her, her last years of life um, in comparison to something like hyenas where we saw Corky and Ribbon there uh, fighting, battling, blood involved, yes, you know, yes. and it's, it's interesting to see uh, that dynamic and how different it is and how they fight over that position. Oh, it's always, always fascinating. But the other question is, um, how often will a lower ranking uh, official member try and take over from the, mm. from the... 
it's highly unusual uh, from my experience this is the first case i've heard of something like that i mean ribbon to be so low ranking and then overtake corky uh, was a fascinating thing oh, very fascinating well we're going to stay with the hyena theme we're going to take a look at hyena pool party That was hilarious. Thirsty Thursday, yes indeed. But the hyena was completely submerged in the water. I would have done the same thing. There's Ribbon walking on the other side of the dam. Bro, get back in there. Come on. You know you want to. Oh, there you go. Isn't that nice? Huh? Isn't that nice? Careful for the crocodiles. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. There's no crocodiles. No, no, don't get out. Oh, I was joking. So from around the the third hyena, it's lying on the on the bank there where this boy is about to go. Is a surprise. Who's got a the sorter, you can see, he's licking it there. Oh, shame, man. Looks like he's actually lost his toe completely. Because you can see the bottom, the bo you can see the, the three little, little pads, and then the one pad is not there. You can see where that red, sort of where the meat is. Shame, man. And I've heard that these guys can be very brutal and very kind of very quite quite violent with each other to uh, to maintain the hierarchy. Fascinating. So this is something that I haven't quite had the privilege to uh, see before and was rather interesting to to witness it but obviously this uh, hyena had submerged himself in that water uh, it was a really hot day and he was cooling himself down um, the question I had for you is this a uh, normal uh, behavior for these for these hyenas yeah for spotted hyenas absolutely it's something I've seen many times and being like you say a warm day mm. that is why they do it you know we can we can chat about whether it's play or necessity um, in this case due to the weather mm. when they did it out of necessity and sometimes you even see groups of them wallowing together um, just to cool down but I do think they sometimes have a little bit of fun yeah, as well definitely it looked it looked like a lot of fun uh, now usually what we deal with down in the Eastern Cape is brown hyena and this is something that I've never really seen brown hyena doing is this a, a usual thing for yeah, spotties yeah it is definitely usual and also I believe of the four hyena species the only one that I know that I've seen I'm mm. um, getting into the water like this is and if it? we think of other predators like lions and leopards not really enjoying water hyenas are the exception to that amazing well let us have a look at the next highlight which is a lioness calling all right so according to the mathematics if my mathematics is correct which often isn't she should walk right past us here. We're going to hold our pose. We're going to hold our position. Yo, look at this. This is fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, she's actually picked up the scent of that drag mark because it's on the side of the road. Right, yeah, she's walking right past us now. Look at that. Oh, and she's a little bit hungry as well. All right, the hyenas are fully aware that something is happening. Cubs have darted into the, the den, I think, in, in the dentrance, so the entrance of the den. Oh, 
Uh, Alex, I've seen lionesses walking by themselves before. I mean, they are usually with the, the other females and with the pride. But, I mean, you're going to have different needs with each individual of that pride. Some might be full, some might not be thirsty. In her case, she might be very thirsty. No one else is going for water, so might as well go by myself. <laughs> Michelle, that we do. Man, I wish uh, all of you could just be on this this vehicle with me right now. You are, but uh, you know, right on the back seats with me. I mean, this is something that I never thought in my wildest dreams we would ever come across this morning. Especially that the way in which we came across. So it's 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 very intense. The entire experience here has been intense and in a very good way since I arrived here at Juma. So a lovely sighting with a beautiful, beautiful lioness and obviously she was calling a little bit. What we don't know is that there was another female lion that was heading in her direction. She had just crossed over from Torchwood and was heading towards Twin Dams. Uh, that female was at the dam was calling quite softly though. She was very softly in comparison to a roar mm. that we usually associate with lions which is a more guttural sound that really can travel very far. Mm. But it makes complete sense that she was calling like that if there was another lioness heading in her direction quite quickly and that she didn't actually need to make a louder noise to to reach lions further away mm. uh, perhaps that was the lioness that she was trying to talk to absolutely and that lioness she was moving quite quickly uh, according to the guides that were following her over the radio um, and we were hoping that maybe we would be able to see the sighting unfortunately we were unlucky but what we're going to do now is we're going to take a short little break and then we're going to dive into some flora focus with steve in the eastern cape <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Steve and this is Flora Focus and today we're looking at a, a remarkable plant we find down here in the Albany Thicket. 
It is the speck boom, also known as the elephant plant, because the elephants love to eat this plant. The scientific name, Portslacaria afra, uh, down here in the thicket biome, we regard this plant as an indicator species. So it's very, very important for the conservation status of this area. This is a plant that manages or look to, uh, to consider the, the effects of browsing on the landscape, and the speck boom is an indicator for that. The plant is edible, although it's not very tasty. But if you're out here on a walk, you're out getting dehydrated, you can chew the leaves for thirst uh, to tackle dehydration and even heat stroke. Uh, the plant itself is very good for any skin ailment, any issue on the skin from blisters, burns, rashes, even pimples can be used to treat skin ailments if you've been out in the sun for too long. Uh, the plant itself is very, very high in vitamin C and it is favoured by most of the indigenous game here in South Africa in the thickets. Thank you for focusing on some flora with me. See you next time. So, speckworm, a lovely, lovely plant. I must disagree with Steve. Uh, I do love the taste of speckworm. It's not something that I would eat on a daily, but it does have quite a quite a nice taste to it. And I know the Ellies love it. They are forever going for the plant, obviously because it's a succulent as well, and it does have some good uh, uses in it. Uh, is speckworm something that you could maybe find in the low fold somewhere? So not naturally occurring, no. It's not something we okay. see out on drive or anything like that, but it is something that I've seen growing in gardens of houses around the hood spread area for okay. example so I think it's an incredibly hardy plant in that mm. way and can survive in some tough conditions so with enough love mm -hmm. and attention I think you could get it to grow really in most gardens around mm. South Africa it's a it's a rather pretty plant to have in your garden I think uh, and very very good for hedges we are now going to take a look at the next video which is spotlight versus infrared Human beings are a diurnal species. We become almost blind without the sun or a full moon. For this reason, discovering what animals do under the cover of darkness has been difficult. On game drives, spotlights continue to be the default option when watching nocturnal creatures. But visible light makes animals that need to be cloaked in darkness visible to their predators and their prey. Using white light must unfortunately affect behavior. This is why we have chosen to use infrared light to view animals at night. Infrared light is invisible to all the animals that we film. It is also invisible to us as human beings. We are able to use infrared because the cameras that we use can see infrared. The cameras convert the infrared picture to a black and white image. Using infrared allows us to view all animals at night without affecting their behavior, making them more vulnerable or giving them an unfair advantage. Other sophisticated techniques for nighttime viewing include thermal imaging, something we have used in the past and will hopefully use again. As technology progresses and becomes more accessible, we will evolve our approach to filming in the dark. The magic of the African night remains mysterious and we will continue to use technology to uncover the wild secrets cloaked in darkness. So the infrared is quite a nifty little invention and really, really helps us. Obviously, it uh, aids us with the ability to see animals uh, like 
cheetah and wild dogs at night time whereas with a spotlight this wouldn't be possible uh we'll talk a little bit about the negatives with mm. spotlights and trying to find animals at exactly nighttime and and like you said it's it wouldn't be possible because of the negative impact that uh, a spotlight has on what we refer to as daytime animals affecting yes. their vision so if you think of your eyes or our eyes as mm. humans how we adjust at night time takes a little bit of time until we can really see well yes. and it's exactly the same for these animals so what the infrared does is basically eliminates that what uh, altogether yeah. and we can then allow them to continue and not have any sort of um, impact on the adjustment period for their eyes Wow. Well, very cool. But usually we use the spotlight just to find the animal and then we'll always switch over to the infrared to not bother their eyes too much. We are now going to have a look at one of our favorite little highlights and that is Chalamba and her little cub. Ladies and gentlemen, the queen of Juma, have a look-see and a little one. This is what we wanted. We Oopsie daisy. It's all sorts going on in this car. This is what we needed. This is what we wanted. Everybody wanted to see her. I wanted to see her. And there she is. How cool is this? Oh. Maybe go up into the tree there. I think you should go into the tree. Darcy, I've... Ew. He sent Parker good game. I can't tell you. I've been waiting for this moment. Oh, seems like somebody, somebody else maybe marked against that tree. Linda, exactly, that's what they need to do. I need to climb up that tree. Get up in there. Where's the road from here? Okay. Still a fair distance. Madam, please don't go up that way. I can see she's facing um, more west now as opposed to southwest. No, 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 no. Oh, of course. She's going into the thicker thicket. Isn't that a cute sighting? Now we're standing next to the map where Amy's going to show us just more or less where that sighting was. Yep, so that was here at Gauri Dam. And our camp is actually right over here next door where we're standing at this very moment. Now, there was another female leopard that's also been seen very close to camp here. And her name is Shadulu. Uh, and I've actually seen a sighting uh, where Shadulu was next to a little, well, she had a little kill and uh, Talamba had come up the path. Do you think that this could potentially be a problem for her, well, Ch Talamba and her cub? It definitely could be. Leopards are territorial animals and uh, should Shadulu encounter Talamba, as you've mentioned, it can be something that can be a threat to her and her cup. So I'm going to use blue to represent Shadulu. She's known as the Duchess of the West and this is sort of what her territory is looking like on Juma. That's sort of the line including Gauri Dam, mm -hmm. our camp and Treehouse Dam which is over there. And then if I use red to represent Talamba, she sort of comes in this area and there's this overlap in the middle that's forming there. And so if these two uh, leopardesses encounter each other which we have said they I saw them here up in quarantine clearings just outside our camp and you saw them down here and there's a bit of a standoff they mm -hmm. didn't have physical contact which is great but yes. there was a dynamic at play with these two territorial females and should Lilamba and her cub or the cub come into contact with Shadulu without mom there to protect her it can be a threat and potential danger for the little one so we just have to hope that mom protects it and keeps her away more into the east than the west well, absolutely. Let's hope that uh, the Queen of Duma manages to keep her little prize jewel out of the hands of the Duchess of the West.
utazuzuma utajiwa ingwe na tingala We've got these long claws. Obviously, we saw them this morning, but if some of you weren't uh, tuned in, we saw these, uh, there's two of them inside this tree here. Um, one big one, one small one, we think male and female. We saw them climbing up the side of this tree uh, very intently, and uh, we were trying to figure out wh what the story is in here. <laughs> is this their little, their little humble the bird? Um, and they've got long, long claws, which is obviously what's helping her climb this uh, particular part of the tree got a very big nostril very big ear. you see that that hole that's just below and below and behind the 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 ear i keep saying the ear i mean the eye just behind the eye that is the ear that is how they hear <laughs> how does she get in there i suppose that's a very safe place for her I'm not too sure if it was wesley or leslie that asked the question but yes they can they can get ticks. Um, if if snakes can get ticks, lizards can get ticks as well. I've I've observed uh, ticks on top of uh, a rink house before, um, and uh, it it wasn't just one actually. It was I think it was three or four big big ticks. Well, wasn't that a fantastic sighting? Something that I'm not accustomed to seeing. Uh, in the Eastern Cape, we usually have the rock monitors nesting in termite mounds or soft sand next to the road. Is this uh, a usual sighting uh, that can be seen in the low felt? It is, Eric. It's actually quite normal to see them using uh, tree cavities like that, uh, something I see quite regularly. Okay. And in fact, a pair like that uh, is going into breeding. So from October to around December every year, that's when we see the these uh, rock monitors starting to lay their eggs and they will use a hollow tree cavity like that to do so. Wow it was uh, they were quite large large lizards inside that tree cavity uh, what do they usually consume so they are carnivores by nature okay. preying on other even smaller reptiles small birds eggs of other animals uh, but they also can scavenge and they themselves are a favorite uh, prey item for something like a martial eagle which is one of the bigger Ooh. eagles that we find in the area wouldn't that be something to see ladies and gentlemen that brings us to the end of our lovely little show here amy thank you very much for joining we hope that you have enjoyed all of the conversations that we have had regarding a lot that's going on in juma and we hope that you'll be joining us next week on safari Tatsuzuma, Utachiwa, Iwe, Natingala.